All right, it's good to see everybody. We're glad uh, to gather tonight, and uh, a lot of things happening in May. Can't believe I'm saying it's May, but it is May today. Uh, so, <clears throat> a lot of things happening this month. <clears throat> There's always a lot of emphases uh, during the month of May. The first, this coming Sunday, is Seasoned Adult Sunday. And uh, Ken Whitten, who was a longtime pastor at uh, Idlewild Baptist, is going to be here. Jeff will also be here. And Jeff, Jeff and Ken have a really close relationship, and Jeff's going to be driving him up. But uh, that'll, be, that'll be a great time together. And, um, and then on the, uh, on the next Sunday, the 12th, will be Mother's Day. It'll be a packed Sunday. We have child dedication. Um, and, uh, and we'll recognize mothers. We will uh, receive the uh, One More Child Mother's Day offering. Uh, and we're also going to kind of have a little bit of a highlight for our Mom Co., which used to be Mops. It's not Mops anymore. It's Mom Co. now. So... Um, Big a full day on the twelfth, on the nineteenth as well. John will be preaching. It'll be Graduate Recognition Sunday, and that'll be a great day in the Lord. Also, <clears throat> uh, things are kind of winding down on Wednesday nights. Uh, next Wednesday is the last Wednesday for this of the summer, uh, for the summer of Awana and Common Ground. We're going to take a break in Common Ground this summer and kick back off in, in the fall when all the other activities kick off. Uh, the the um, Crave, the students will meet up until the 15th, but on the 15th they're just having kind of an end-of-year party type of thing. So, so a lot of things happening in May, and uh, I'm glad you're here. And uh, I'll need some help singing tonight. I'm struggling a little bit. Uh, I guess it's just seasonal allergies. Uh, so before we uh, sing these first couple songs, Psalm 27, Psalm of David, uh, many of you are familiar with this. One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. You know, I, I heard a pastor preach one time, and he said, it's always been a mystery to me when you look in Revelation and those heavenly beings uh, where in either Revelation 4 or 5 where it says, Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the pastor said something along the lines of, I might could make it an hour or two. He said, but what I think, what in my, in my imagination, what I think, keeps them going for has kept them going for millennia upon millennia is that every time they they cry that word of praise to the Lord and that make that declaration the Lord reveals a new facet of his glory and his glory is endlessly beautiful and so I think maybe David had a little bit of a glimpse of that when he said just let me gaze upon the beauty of the Lord all the days of my life. We're going to sing a little bit about that up front. So will you help me out as we sing this great old hymn, The Lily of the Valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul.
couple of hymns we're going to sing tonight. <clears throat> Friends, because he lives, everything has changed. Everything changes in our lives, in our walk, in our faith. Uh, because he lives, we too can and will, if we are his, will live forever. I'm reminded of my son uh, on Easter Sunday morning. He texted me and he texted me the passage uh, where Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, but then in speaking with the ladies, what did he say? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever believes in, uh, lives and believes in me will never die. What a promise. What a promise. Let's sing this together. God sent his son.
all pray, all we, we can all say that with sincerity. Roger. Thank you so much. Before, we, before I pray, I want to give you uh, this testimony. I met a gentleman in, in uh, Live Oak not too long ago. I haven't seen him in years. And he has a tremendous testimony. And I want to show you the power of God and the example that God can use anybody. I will not give you his name, but he used to ride with a motorcycle gang, gang called the Hells Angels. And if you know anything about that group, motorcycle group, you do not leave the angels. There's only one way that you leave, and it's not good. But somewhere along the line, he met Jesus, and he had to leave. He told the group, he said, I've got to leave. And he walked out, and I invited him to a, a ministry that we were having. And he said, uh, Mr. Roger, he said, uh, I really don't want to do that because I've got to be careful where I go and who I see because uh, people are looking for me. And, he said, and uh, he said, I just don't want to get you in jeopardy. And I said, my friend, I would take a bullet for you if it came to that. I said, you wouldn't have any problem. You come to our ministry and you will be fine. But that goes to show you, and he said, since I met Jesus, and I just saw him a couple of weeks ago at a local grocery store, and I said, are you still walking with the Lord? He said, Jesus has been everything to me. He's changed my whole life. And I just want to testimony, testify to God's power and the ability to deliver anybody from anything. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. This is a subject I did not want to do, but I felt in my heart that it needs to be shared. And Holy Spirit, you know perfectly well I cannot do this by myself. I ask for your anointing. I ask that you be pleased and Jesus will be honored for the truth behind it, for his honor and for his glory. Amen. I was a little reluctant to talk about this tonight. And I hope that you will come back. I hope that tonight, after tonight, you will love me just as much as you do now. But uh, I want to talk about, it's out of Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man went to a place called hell. Now, I realize that right off the bat that that subject is maybe a little bit uneasy to hear about, a little uncomfortable perhaps, but I think that you'll see that we will do it, uh, uh, we'll be okay through it. But uh, the, counter, the counter to that is you come back next week because we will be sharing next week and uh, we're going to talk about heaven and will we, will we recognize one another in heaven and according to Revelation, we're going to have a brand new name in heaven. We're going to talk about that next week. So if you don't like tonight's message, you come back next week and we'll just change. We'll do 180 degrees. But anyway, I want us to look at about six or seven different aspects of this place called hell. If you'd prefer, I would just say either Hades or this very uncomfortable place, if that's more comfortable to you. But anyway, I want us to see it's more than just a story, uh, a good parable. It's not even a parable. But it's, a, it's an indication and a contrast between um, mercy and judgment. Now, one thing about mercy is that all of us at one point in time in our life required mercy from God. And Jesus, in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 41, Jesus had compassion on a man and he stretched out his arm and touched that man. I think, really believe in my heart, he did the same thing for my friend here locally. But uh, compassion, we've all had compassion on different people at different times. But the one thing about compassion is that Jesus extended mercy, and mercy is the byproduct of compassion. You really cannot have compassion on anyone unless you extend that out and, and add, act or act, interact with mercy, because mercy is the byproduct of compassion. 
And that's what Jesus did for you and for me. Before you said yes to Christ, uh, we were just like this beggar in this story. But let's look at it together and starting in verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and, and, sump, and had sumptuous uh, dinner every day. There was also a certain beggar named Lazarus. Now notice they did not name the rich man. I think the Holy Spirit did that on purpose because he did not want to give it any clarity. But the rich man Lazarus was laid at the gate full of sores, and even the dogs came and licked his sores, and all he said was, I want uh, a scrum from the rich man's table uh, while the dogs were licking his sores. And it came to pass that in heaven, oh, I'm sorry, and it came to pass that the beggar died, and notice this, don't miss this in verse 22. The beggar who did not have any axe to grind, didn't have anything, but he was a, a godly man from other sources, says that he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And Abraham's bosom in scripture refers to Christ. And notice that, that he was carried. And my friends, when, when your heart stops beating that first time and you take your last breath, a wonderful thing is that the angels are going to minister to you and carry you to Christ. That's a wonderful thought for me, personally. And all of us have lost loved ones. And to think that, that God is going to carry them personally by angels to himself is a wonderful thing. Then we go on to say, and, and uh, in verse 20, 23, uh, oh, then the rich man died. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice that the rich man was not carried anywhere. He just died. I read a commentary was that uh, they probably just dug a hole and put him in it. There's no clarity in the rich man. It's not a contrast between rich and poor and even good or bad. But the rich man is identified as the world system. They don't care. He didn't care anything about Lazarus, didn't care anything about anybody other than himself. And there's some evidence that we're going to see a few verses later that he may have been uh, acquainted with uh, God and uh, in Christ. He didn't acknowledge it, but I think he was acquainted because later on we're going to see in a few verses uh, on down here. And so they are both uh, died. And notice this in verse 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Number one, hell is a real place. I wish I could identify where geographically it's located. I don't have anything definitive to identify where it is geographically. But I don't really think that makes a difference. Wherever it is, it is in a state of condition. It's a terrible Terrible place to be, to go. But it is a real place. Some commentaries have indicated that it possibly is some deep valley over outside of the Middle East. I would kind of dismiss that. But wherever it is, it's a real place. And the only reason a person goes there, the only reason this rich man went there, wasn't because he was rich, not at all. Because he had abandoned Christ. It reminds me in some cases of 2 Timothy uh, 3, 5, where it says, they have the form of godliness, but they deny the power. And sad to say, that's the same, some condition in a lot of our churches, is that we just give lip service to God. And I think this was the rich man's case. All he was concerned about was himself. But the beggar who had nothing was carried to Abraham's bosom. Now look at this in verse 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes and being in torment and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus is in his bosom. Now that's, a, that's kind of a, a play on words. But he was being caressed, this uh, beggar was, by the Lord Jesus. Now, number one, it's a real place. And number two, this rich man was in a hell by himself. He was alone in solidarity. 
let me, let me give you a little bit uh, interruption here. I was talking with a man not too long ago, and he shook me to my core. We were talking about the church and religion and different things, and he said, I know that you, you Christians have a place called hell. And this is what he said to me. I don't think it's the prevailing attitude of everyone, but he said, if I happen to go to this place, I'm going to burn up for a little bit, and then I'll cease to exist, and that'll be the end of me. I don't want to have anybody tell me what I'm doing is wrong. And I said, my friend, you have it all backwards. I wish that I could have, I wish I could share with you that I shared with him the gospel, but he did not want to hear anything about God, about the gospel, about Christ. And my heart broke when I left him. I said, God, this man is headed for a place that he does not know exists. And he said, he made one statement. He said, I'll be there with all my friends. We'll have one big party. Notice that this man is in solidarity by himself, in torment. And number three, he, is, he has conscious, he was conscious, and he had memory. And plus the fact in number four, he was suffering in his physical and his emotional. He was in torment. And so he said, he looked up because he, he was conscious. And he said, Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And it's funny that the scripture uses his tongue. I'll bet probably in his lifetime he said verbally, uh, probably, derogatory things about Christ, maybe, derogatory things about this beggar. And so this is the, the payment that he has gotten. And you say, why can't God give him mercy just like he gave us? Because we represented that beggar before we said yes to Christ. Uh, we're going to see why. And so he said, and notice what Abraham says. If I get to, if I get to crying, I can't see. Uh, verse, 20, uh, verse 24. And he cries out, he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. Notice he said, Father Abraham. I'll bet you that he's, he remembers back some revival he was in, heard a, a good message, gospel message. And he said, maybe I can get a second chance. Maybe somehow God will have mercy on me because I heard that Baptist preacher talking about God gives mercy to all those that, that screech out, that reach out to him. But notice that there are no second chances because look, look at what the... Look what the Lord said. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are in torment. And besides this, there's a great gulf fixed between us so that, there, that, way, way, that they which want to come pass from one side to the other cannot. Neither can you pass from here and go to there, and they can't come from there and come here. It's fixed. That great gulf is fixed. So not only is he in, a, in an awful place, he's in torment, he's by himself, there's no friends around, there's no party going on, he's in agony, and there's, he's in the flame. And Matthew 22, if you read that about the great supper, there was a man who came into this great supper, but he didn't have a wedding garment on. And it's a parable. But the king says, take that man and throw him into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And that's hell. It doesn't really specify here, but I really would imagine that, that this rich man was in the dark. He was in torment physically and emotionally. And uh, he had no... No recourse from anything. Now, I, I know that this sounds a little bit negative, and, but as I said in the beginning, 
you come back next week, we'll change the whole scenario. But I just wanted to get you because if you run across somebody in your travels and they start making comments about hell, in a nice way, let them know that, that you don't even want to bring up that name, that word. It's, an, it's a real place. It's an awful place. But anyway, and God said that because remember John 3.16? Some of you could probably quote that for heart. But notice one phrase, one little word in that uh, John 3.16 highlights this. For God so loved the world that gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not, what? Perish. Is appointed unto man one time to die and then the judgment. And my friends, God, God is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying to the world, to you and to me and the church, to everybody. There is a time come, there's a day coming when we all have to surrender our life. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna die. But he said, if you die without Christ, it is a sad, sad day. That's why that when this gentleman told me that Jesus made all the difference in his life, he knew what would happen if he, if he was ever caught by one of those angels in his bike club. He said, I would, he told me how many times he had been beaten, shot, stabbed. I'm not trying to be gross, fo folks. I'm not. We're, we're all family here, but I'm just giving you a reality check that when Christ delivered him, he walked away for fear of his life. But God has protected him. And when I saw him two weeks ago, he said, Jesus had made all the difference to me. Anyway. So, and he's, and and Abraham said, there's a fixed gulf, and you can't, it's impossible to cross. It's inescapable. <clears throat> and verse 27, look at this, and he said, therefore, I pray you, send somebody back home to my father's house, because I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, and whatever it takes, keep them from coming to a plate this awful place. That's a sense of urgency. It's a mandate. And we do not take it seriously, I don't think. And in other places, I read where God had compassion and extended mercy to the line. And he said, it's, it's a sense of urgency. And why do you think that the enemy is so, so much prevalent and prevailing nowadays in getting our young people focused on every day, everything under the sun except the Lord Jesus. I've told you this before, and I'll, I'll repeat it until the last time I draw my breath. Satan doesn't care a thing about you, but he hates Jesus Christ. You can talk about God all day long. You can talk about uh, anything all day long. But you mention Jesus, and the hair on the back of, of Satan's neck stands up because he can't stand Jesus. Why do you think that all of this chaos in the world is going on? The problem of Israel over in the Middle East. I could solve that thing if I could go over there in 24 hours. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be smart, but, but I'd have to pay for it. I would die. They would, they would kill me. But uh, Jesus is the answer to all of these things. But anyway, let's go on. How are we doing so far? Is everybody, uh, well, everybody's still here. Anyway, that's good. Uh, there's the great gulf fixed, and I have five brothers. And Abraham said unto him, they, have, they had Moses and the prophets, and they can hear them. And if they wouldn't listen to Moses and the prophets, the equivalent to that is if they've heard good messages, southern gospel, powerful messages from the pulpit, and they reject that, they're not going to listen to anybody that even if they came back from the dead. That's how serious this is with God. We need to witness. We need to share. 
And I know that, that that sounds like that we're not doing enough. But I make, a, I make it a habit when I go someplace. I don't, I don't do it very well, but I let them know that Christ is, is the answer to all of their problems. And one lady at Walmart the other day, wonderful, kind a lady, said, thank you for that. The guy down at Harbor Freight, he thanked me. Because I asked him, something told me, I, I shared this before, something told me when I ch checked out, go back, before I hit the door, he said, go back and, and ask that gem gentleman about the Lord. And I said, I said, Lord, and I was honest. I said, you know that's how embarrassing that is? Because people are waiting in line. But I went back and there was nobody, there was one guy coming and I said, he'll have to wait. I said to this man, I won't tell you his name, I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? He said, no, go ahead. I said, do you know what it means to be saved? He said, yes, I do. I'm saved by the blood. And he thanked me for witnessing. He said, thank you for taking the courage to witness to me. He said, you're the first person that ever has asked me about the Lord. I said, you know what? I couldn't go to my car. I couldn't get out the door. And I'm not, I'm not saying that about me, but my friends, we got to be sensitive to the spirit. And he said, if somebody came back from the dead, they would not listen to him. Uh, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And one thing about this hellfire, uh, another thing this gentleman told me, Turn to Luke chapter 3, verse 17. Luke 3, 17. He said, he made the statement, and it broke my heart. He said, if I, I'll suffer pain for a little bit, then I'll die and I'll burn up and I'll cease to exist. 3, 17 says this. It's talking about the wheat and the chaff at the end times whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. My friends, that word unquenchable, I looked it up in the Greek language of which the New Testament is written. And guess what word that we have, the Greek word for, for our unquenchable, that means it will not burn, consume. It'll burn, but it won't consume. It means... Um, as it's a, the word is as best tone. Now you ladies who are good in the kitchen, where do we get uh, what do we get word from that? Asbestos. That's what oven mitts are made of, I guess, silicone and asbestos or something. Anyway, can you think of another place in the Bible? Now this is a quiz. If you don't get the answer to this correct, you can't come back next week, even though it's going to be good next week. Uh, can you think of another place where something was on fire and it was, but it wasn't consumed? Burning the burning bush. Moses looked at that and said, what in the world is going on? That's the power of God. But my friends, that man broke my heart. But it's real. And it's a fire that will never be quenched. It will never be put out. And you say, if God is so loving, this is the, the question that I get a lot. If God is such a loving God, why in the world would he send anybody to hell? He doesn't send anybody there. It's a choice. That's the reason that Satan is so active today to keep anybody from focusing on the Lord Jesus as the answer to the problems of the world. I apologize for what I said about going over there and fixing the Middle East problem in 24 hours. I apologize for that. <clears throat> but anyway... But he is the answer. Anyway, I want to end up with this. Turn to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66. And verse 2. For all of those things, which is talking about the previous verse... 
that I have personally made and all of those things that have been, says the Lord, but to this, my man, I will look. He takes special notice on this. A man who is poor and a contrite heart and trembles at my word. And I made a statement just to somebody this morning. I said, we don't fear God enough. Now, friends, this has nothing to do with, with uh, heart palpitations and being so, so much in fear that we can't eat, we can't sleep, but it means a high grade of reverence for Almighty God. We're not, we're, we're not fearful of God. And we don't take, I don't think, it very seriously at times. We're very comfortable where we are, short of a, a, a tragedy, but we're really comfortable. But God says, I want, I'm looking at a man with a contrite heart. In Second Chronicles chapter 9, I believe it is, God says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking a heart who's dedicated to me, whose heart is upright towards me. And God will move heaven and earth for that heart, for that man. And let's see, I wanted to, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 31, Acts 9, 31, or yes, this is after, this is after, uh, Barnabas, who was the friend of uh, of Paul, he brought his brother down to Caesarea because everybody wanted to kill Paul. Everybody wanted to kill him because he was preaching the gospel. But the power of God says this in verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And I, I maintain that in all churches, and I may even dare say in ours, even though we have one of the greatest churches in the country, that we, if we would walk in God's fear and have a broken heart, for him. I talked to somebody this morning and it broke my heart because I listened to this person talk about how broken they have been. And the only resource they had was the Lord Jesus. And I said, congratulations. Because God is active and Satan is also active, especially with our young people. Just, just a little glimpse of next week. We're going to talk about, will we recognize each other in heaven? And we're going to be given a brand new name and a white tablet. That's in Revelation. So you come back next week and we'll share again. Bring somebody with you. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I pray that you were glorified today, Jesus. I did the best I could, but thank you for your support. Thank you for lifting me up, and thank you for the truth behind us. It was not an easy message to deliver, but yet it was truthful. This awful place is a real place. And I don't want anyone to think, make light of it. So Heavenly Father, through your Holy Spirit, prick our heart. If we run across someone who's confused about where they're going, tell them to seek Jesus in John 3, 16. For your honor, for your glory, in your mighty name, amen. Amen.